All right, we're live. live. For hey, those who've been listening, we've been, this mess? We've, been, we've been live for about a minute already because I was watching that live uh, thing come on there. So, hey, welcome back to uh, <laughs> welcome back to Fire Engineering's Hump Day Hangout and to our show, The Issues and Challenges of Today's Fire Service. Um, I'm Rick Lasky, uh, my co-host, uh, Assistant Chief Terry McGrath, for those who will be joining us shortly. They have a ton of stuff, cool stuff, Scott, right? Going out yes. of Louisville, building... It's incredible what's going on there. Very um, cool stuff. Promotions, and, and, retirements. Oh, God. And we've got a great show lined up with our team, with our team, with this uh, Chief John Salka, Chief Bobby Halton, and Chief Scott Thompson. Um, and we've got a very special guest today, uh, one of all of our favorites. And I can say that because we just love this guy. Uh, we've got the old professor, uh, Glenn Corbett. Uh, uh, in fact, let me, I'm going to read you Glennie's bio. Um, uh, for, for our listeners. Um, a lot of people know Glenn. I think I I'll think, come back in 10 minutes. Then if you know, <laughs> I, I got to get a, I got to top off my coffee. It's, you know, it, what's kind of funny is I mentioned Glennie in class all the time and people go, well, as soon as you say the old professor, you start hitting, they go, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And they all know his stuff. They all know what he writes, but, but Glenn Corbett is associate professor of fire science at John Jay college of criminal justice in New York city is a technical editor for Chief Halton for Fire Engineering Magazine and was an assistant chief of the Waldwick, New Jersey Fire Department serving uh, Waldwick for many years. He previously held the position Administrator of Engineering Services with the San Antonio Fire Department in Texas. Glenn has a Master of Engineering degree in Fire Protection Engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. He is the co-author. This is really cool. And, and I, well, we're going to talk about this in a second. He's the co-author of the late Frank Brannigan's Frank Building Construction for the Fire Service, uh, the sixth edition now. Uh, he served as editor of Fire Engineering's Handbook for Fire 412, and Glenn is an FDIC, uh, Executive Advisory Board Member mm -hmm. for Chief Halton again, uh, and, and Diane Rothschild, and began his fire service career in 1978. And I wanted to, Glenn, I just think it's cool. We all know, if you're, if you're at all into the fire service, you know who Frank Brannigan is the original old professor, right? The old, you know, we talk about it. Um, and I know your relationship, you were so close with Frank. Um, and everybody that's anybody, the fire service studied Frank's original, all his different editions of building construction construction. I remember if you looked at it, you had to actually pick, and he actually wrote it. Don't you're not gonna read it cover to cover. You're actually, I'm gonna go talk, look ordinary. I'm gonna go, and it was a great book, but then you two saddled up together. And uh, it started working out before his passing and came out with, I think, is an incredible version because you got scenarios based. On, it's like you're reading about a particular type of construction and then there's scenarios to back it up. And so you can you can put it together for the students for the, or for the young firefighter. But I think it's cool. Glenn, you're, you're one of the most modest people that I think we've all met um, that you still do this and you still and you do. You give all the credit to Frank. And, uh, and you still push it out there. And I, I think it's wonderful. I think it's absolutely, Bobby, how about it? It's just so cool that he does that. I don't think so. I, I, <laughs> I think it's awful. I, I think you ought to throw Frank under the bus and take all the credit. <laughs> you know, like other people do, right? Yeah, I mean, like other people do, right? Yeah. We should probably call you the, we should probably call you the old professor junior. <laughs> that's, well, me. that's me. Glad you get just hysterical. Just awesome, just awesome. So, uh, to a reminder to our our, our viewers, uh, whether you, you know if you if you well, we're live after obviously not what's recorded later on. But as a reminder, if you have any questions, uh, switch over, shoot over to Twitter, and, and throw them out there at hashtag fe talk. And either Pete, our producer, or myself, I'll be checking. We'll get those for you. And we, and we called this one. Let's talk the old days. Time for history lesson. How this actually came together for our, for our viewers is. John Salk and I were talking, we're always, we're, you know, we talk multiple times a day and he, he just, you know, John, he just kind of works around his house at his office. Sometimes he finds bags full of money and diamonds and rubies. And he finds, <laughs> he finds, he finds like he, so he found box of boxes, Glennie. He found boxes, Glennie of, of, of MFD journals. And we'll talk about, New York Volunteer Fire Department to Metropolitans to the FDNY. He goes, oh yeah, I had these box, this box of these journals. And I'm like, oh my God, I've been looking for one of those for like decades. And when you find one, it's like thousands of dollars to get it if it's in all good shape. And, and then we start talking about, you know, the penmanship and this stuff. And, the, and we go, we got, we got to, we got to get Glennie on the show. 
and and everybody was like, Scott was like, God, I love this. I love this top. I love Glenn. And I know your relation with Bobby and, and just, so anyway, that's how it all started. Glenn, he was us talking about those journals. Um, and John, where do you, do you remember where you found them? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll tell you, I know exactly where I found them. I know exactly where I found them. I found them when I was a probationary firefighter in 34 engine in midtown Manhattan in 1979, 1980. And I worked either in overtime or a detail or something in three engine, which is over there on 19th street with 12 truck. And that I, I think they were working on annual inspection or something. I specifically remember they were cleaning out the hose tower and throwing them in a dumpster. Oh, and I and I got about ten of them, and about thirty of them went to the Staten Island landfill. Wow! Oh God! Well, and I told you, you know, and and Bobby, I've shared this with you and Glennie. I was up outside Albany, New York, years ago teaching, and they were like, "Oh, you need to come downstairs and see our new command training center we did." And we, you know, I'm like, "All right." We go down and I go, "Yeah, this was just like our junk room for like decades." And we finally cleaned it out and we, and we put this, we, 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 we went in and I go, what was in it? They go, oh, we had boxes of our old journals. And I go, well, what would you do? And they go, oh, we tossed them out. We don't need them. We have computers. I go, oh, they go, no, no, they're gone. So this is the same place, Glennie. I'm teaching in their classroom. And they got to, remember, they had the door propped open to the classroom. Bobby, I swear to God, Scott, they have the door propped open. And I look and I see, I go, wow, that looks like an old speaking trumpet. And I, I go down, look, it's their original department from the 18, early 1800s speaking trumpet. Uh, we don't call them bugles, right, Glenny? Speaking trumpet. They were using it. It had a little dent. They were using it, Bobby, to prop the door open to, to the training room, you know? I, I why, just, why, if anybody's surprised by that, <laughs> right? Because, you know, anything in the past is not important, you know, is it? Just the right, they call it presentism, which is an amazing phenomena. And, and, and we are on a whirlwind of presentism right now where, you know, anything that came before is just absolutely worthless. The problem with that is that, and, and the point of today's show is, is that any great idea, any great concept is rooted really in ancient, really, wisdom and, and, and tradition and history. And people who think that, you know, the, the iPhone is going to create anything or just well morons but th but that's a, a topic for another day but the importance of it there's a and by the way there's a great book i always like to throw out a book uh, there's a great book called the unbroken thread for those of you who like to read about why tradition and history and culture is important um, it's called the unbroken thread it's a great book just came out uh, this year it's a fantastic book it's not as good as this book the holy bible but it's a good book <laughs> so um the the it's a it's a wonderful book about how tradition and history and, and, and understanding it all, knowing where we came from, can help us navigate these days of chaos. And and the people who are really fall into um, that that fall that fall for charlatans, that get bamboozled, as Carl Sagan would say, are the people who don't understand history and where we came from, and and they don't understand the the, the principles and the ideas and the and, and the things that came before what we believe today. So they don't know, they don't know how to understand it. They just deconstruct the idea today based upon what they know in their heads right now. But before we begin, I do have to throw out a quick shout out to our sponsor, which is FDIC. Uh, this show is being brought to you by the fine people at the Fire Department Instructors Conference. Uh, and all of these gentlemen that you see in front of you will be there uh, speaking and teaching and, and, and performing. Uh, live uh, for you all <laughs> and performing. Uh, we will, one of them uh, will actually be receiving an incredible award, the Lifetime Achievement Award, which is given to people who've managed to stay alive long <laughs> enough to deserve it. And that would be our good friend, Chief John Salka, who will be receiving Lifetime Achievement on Thursday. So please join <laughs> us for that. We've also combined, uh, we have a new uh, EMS track called GEMS, and the Journal of Emerging Medical Services, which we own, and it's going to be all um, street medicine. So it's going to be this incredible street medicine. If you need EMS credits, they're all CAPSI accredited. Uh, we've got hot classes, five new hot classes that are uh, fully CAPSI accredited. We've got an incredible class being taught by Juan, my, uh, Juan out of, uh, uh, I believe he's out of San Antonio. He may, uh, anyway, he's a, a Texas guy. 
mean, he's got a couple of docs with him, high fidelity simulations involving really difficult uh, airway management stuff. We've got a water rescue class by Mike Hudson, who's probably like the best water rescue guy in the country. We've got um, a moulage class, a two-day moulage class, where you can learn how to moulage people up for your drills at home. We've got a uh, pediatric uh, class for pediatric resuscitation. Those are all hot classes for EMS people. And, and you can take just those if you're an EMS person, but you can take with your FDIC registration, you can take all of that stuff. So we're going to have this thing called the GEMS games. So if you're out there and you're a paramedic right now and, and, you're, and, and, a, and you're in a great system, you can put together a three-person team, fourth person as an alternate, but a three-person team, come to FDIC and compete. The preliminaries are on Tuesday. The main event will be Friday morning on the main stage in the big room. We are going to rock it out of the park. If you've never seen the GEMS games, it's like seeing a movie uh, being filmed. It's like it's so realistic. It's insane. And, and if you think you're worth a tinker's darn, if you're Charles Hood down there right now in San Antonio who's bragging to me about how good his guys are, or maybe this fella Ernie Malone, maybe you heard of him, he's in Indianapolis, or maybe you're, you know, with the department in, say, Texas, and I don't know, like the colony or someplace, and you think your medics are worth a dang, put together a team and come compete for the bragging rights as the best damn paramedics on the street in America today. It is, it's hot stuff, man. If you've never seen it, it's just hot stuff. It's like the combat challenge. It's like the ranger challenge, but with fire department street medics, like going head to head, it's freaking intense. And you get to watch the finalists live. The four finalists come out and perform live in front of like, you know, 4,000 people. So it's insane. So register for FDIC right now. It's going to be amazing. Everybody, you know, Everybody who, all the regulars are going to be there. We got uh, five extrication classes, man versus machine. We've got, uh, we got the elevator rescue we going on. We've got Glenn will be teaching. Rick and John will be doing their five degrees of May Day, I think, as well as their, uh, the other normal stuff they're doing. I know Scott's doing a leadership class and based on his best-selling book on, on fire department leadership, which is amazing. Uh, Glenn will be there talking about the continuing legacy and the importance of constructions and codes and all that good stuff. Jack Murphy, Jerry Tracy, um, Kirk Isaacson, Ray McCormick, you name it. They're going to be there. Uh, some of the, some of the, some of the people you love and, and some really cool new names, Brian Brush and Brian Zates and, and a lot of really, really cool people who are doing really, really great work. You know, you can't, you can't name everybody. It's just amazing. So, you know, make sure your dance card has FDIC. We'll see it at the end of April. Um, it's, it's just going to be amazing. So, we, you know, I can't, I can't uh, say enough about it. And I just want to get that in there that, man, if, if you thought FDIC was something before, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, we're anticipating like 40,000 people. Uh, we, we think it's just going to be freaking incredible. So, uh, and, you know, thank you all for participating. And, and really, thank you, John, for accepting uh, the award and being there it means the world to uh, you know all of us on this call in particular who who've well i wouldn't say known and love you but who've endured you and tolerated you <laughs> over the years i'm just kidding R really uh, who've known and loved you and and um just want a chance to tell the world how much we do love you and admire you so thank you for accepting uh, uh you know that that award and i'm really looking forward to to tell in the world about you and, 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 uh, having you and your family there. So thank you for that. That's a, thank that's you. a, that, that's my commercial interruption. And now back to the show. <laughs> well, and, it, and it's kind of exciting because, you know, August was, was incredibly and pleasantly surprising. I remember John and I stood up in the opening ceremonies and looked around and went, this is August at Indy and we got a pandemic and we have, tw you know, 20,000 people. The place was jammed what a great thing to be doing when we really kick it off back to our normal schedule in April and, you know, all, all, all that. I mean, April 25th through the 30th. Um, uh, what a great, what a great thing. What a great, great, great thing. So that being said, uh, we switch gears back, back uh, to our topic here too. Um, Glennie, before we start talking with John about that journal, let's, you know, you and I, we, we talk to history all the time and everything else. We're always talking about, the New York, the New York Volunteer Fire Department, the NYFD, and then people always ask, why did it switch to the FDNY? And it, we always go, well, you kind of missed a step in the middle there. They they had to be the MFD for a while, and that that's what we got to talk about with these journals was, you know, you know, I always say, you know, who was the first agency to use the Maltese Cross as a symbol for the fire service? And everybody always says 
Boston, Philly. I go, no, I'll give you a hint. They're the, they're the largest combination volunteer career city in the world. And they're all, they're all like this. I go, it's the FDNY. They still have nine volunteer fire companies running around yet, you know, and, and, but they're not part of the FDNY. They've been there a long time, but explain, you know, between you and John, I mean, you know, how we went from just, we'll start things off. A lot of guys ask that question from the New York volunteer fire department and then why they, why they couldn't go to FDNY when they wanted to and had to do the metropolitan for a while. Right. Well, thanks for having me on uh, today on Hump Day Hangouts. This is a great opportunity here. I, um, yeah, it's a really interesting story. Um, I'll condense it. it. It actually starts years before 1865. So the New York City Volunteer Fire Department existed uh, even before the American Revolution, but as an organized group was created right after the Revo American Revolution and lasted right up until the spring of 65, 1865 right after the, at the virtue at the end of the civil war. Um, it was, a, it was a time there and during the civil war of sort of uh, upheaval. Uh, some of the folks might remember the story about the famous draft riots in New York city. Um, and that plays a role with what happens later on, because uh, some of you, if there's one textbook you want to get um, or a book that you like on your shelf, it's a book called heritage of flames. It's written by a guy named Don Cannon. Don was an adjunct for me at John Jay. He taught a class called Fire in New York, and it was very well received. We actually taught at the academy uh, through John Jay. Um, he was also a full-time professor at St. Peter's in Jersey City. But he wrote this sort of a landmark book, and he and I dug deep into the draft riots. And for 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 until this until today, basically, it's always been blamed the start of the draft rights on the volunteer fire companies. And so he did a, he and I did a deep dive. And what we found out was it became very clear to us that, and John won't be surprised about this, but the then what wasn't called the NYPD then, but the police officers, the police department of New York city had a vested interest literally in taking over the fire department. They, you know, they had dealt with them. They There's were a free, shock, you know, right. So, so we have all the documentation that um, the commissioner, one particular commissioner was, was full bore on taking over the fire department. We even have his commentary. They said, if you give me 500 men, I'll run the fire department for you. Um, he ends up in Albany uh, testifying in late 64, early 65 about firefighting New York city. And the other force that's in play here is the insurance industry. Um, they wanted better control over things. They thought that that we were, the city was spending too much money on firefighting, even though they're all volunteers. Um, you know, by, by 1864, 65, so many of the engine companies and hose companies, for that matter, had wanted to get steamers and they thought they could do it much more efficiently. So there's these competing interests against the then New York City Volunteer Fire Department. And they were able to convince the state legislature to effectively move to the creation of a state chartered fire department called the Metropolitan Fire Department. And that's the MFD. So during the spring and early the summer and fall of 65, there's this transition from, okay, we have a volunteer company in this house. It moves to a paid Metropolitan and, and Fire didn't Department. Didn't you say, company. Glenny, volunteers actually about two, half of them became career yeah most of the new guys in the in the mfd were all former volunteers so that, that's where they got their ranks from basically and all the chiefs a lot of the chiefs moved over into career chiefs eli bates being one of the more notable guys but so um, so so to the career guys glenny out there that go yeah. you know these volleys that want to become career guys and all you know let's go back in time and talk about the original you know, and that's how it happened. So I kind of like to throw that out. Most, there. most big city fire departments, their first career firefighters were volu former volunteers because they knew the system. They knew what was needed and things. So, so yeah, the cops, the NY, what became the NYPD had a big role here. Um, and part of it had to do with them throwing assertions that the firemen started the draft rights, which we've pretty much conclusively figured out they didn't do that. But it was enough to push it over we get, you know, we get the MFD. And what's interesting about the MFD is that um, it only lasts for effectively about four years. By the late 69, it's going to be reorganized into what we know as the FDNY today. But it's a, sh it's a relatively short history for this. But what's interesting about it is that the very first MFD companies, for example, 
the officers actually did carry trumpets. They did actually carry speaking horns with them because we have photographs of it. Uh, there's a famous photograph of Ladder One in Lower Manhattan by City Hall with, the, with all the guys on it holding the trumpet. And um, it, it, so we know that they had that. And why that's important is because realistically, the this, this, this symbol of authority that we use to this day, right? We use trumpets to this day um, to signify authority. That's a volunteer era um, artifact, basically. They didn't keep it forever. They only kept, I think it was about two years. Then they dropped it, okay? So that, the, the symbol of authority with the was trumpet. Was that when Motorola discovered electricity? <laughs> <laughs> about that, yes. And how to use electricity, right? So, um, the other, I think the other interesting thing about the MFD, of course, is that um, it's the time period where not only the trumpet comes into play, but um, we don't get the Maltese cross yet, but we're getting versions of it, right? So the Maltese cross that we know today has evolved into sort of the more traditional, I guess, or what we recognize it today, but there were forms of it for, for a few years are leading up to that. The MFD badges are a little bit different, but you could see the elements of the Maltese cross there. Remember the Maltese cross itself is a civil war artifact, right? It came out of the civil war uh, as a core badge basically. And I, there's nothing written about that I've ever found. And we will probably, maybe one day we'll find out the direct connection there, but somebody, someone on the line said, this makes sense to do it this way. Okay. And that's where we get the multi, the eventually get the badge adopted that just about every fire department in America has got a form of basically today. So, so it, even though no one's ever heard the Metropolitan Fire Department, it kind of is the transition from the big city volunteers into the then career professional departments that we and know that, today. That's why it's such a huge deal that we, you know, when you mention it, Glenny, in classes, guys don't know. And I'm like, God, this is such, this is the, this is the link. You know, it's, it's like, this is what takes us from here to here. And nobody ever really talks about it. You know, right. And so the, there's not a lot, you know, there's not like a, t there's like no separate history book of the Metropolitan Fire Department. The history is contained one book that folks might want to look at. And it's most of it's available online now is the Augustine Costello's Our Firemen. It's, it's, it's mostly the volunteer department. It has a bunch about the metros and the very early years, 20 years, it's about, it's about that thick. Yeah. So the first 20 right years of the FDNY, uh, it's a wonderful resource. I use it all the time. Um, and so if anyone's interested in sort of knowing more about who was in play and what was going on, Commissioner Shaler, the famous guy, he's the, hard to believe that he's one of the first commissioners of, of the FDNY. He, um, he institutes a library. He thinks it's so important that he creates the library, you know, 140 years before the man library is even thought of it. Right. So it's like, you know, he thought that that as a professional department, it needs to have sort of a uh, a resource of 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 education and things like that. So all those things that were happening, I mean, you think about tra the training academy, certainly there was training going on. But to think that they put a library in place in, in the early 1870s, it's hard to you know fathom that that they were thinking that way. So. Anyway, so the fact that John has has uh, has received this incredible gift from 40 years ago um, that he saved those. I could tell you this much, though. I think everyone on this call probably knows there was a period in the 1980s where all, or across America, all that stuff was thrown away. I, I can tell you story after story. I've, I've talked to a million people. Thank God for the John Sokos of the world. Thank God for my friend, Chief Comer from Patterson. Thank God for other firefighters who saw the value in these documents and saved them from the trash heap. So well, uh, go it, ahead. It, exactly, Glenn. And John, real quick, I just put up the picture that you sent me uh, of, of the journals, you know, well, one of the journals you have. And, and Glenn, we were talking before, Scott, Bobby, about how a lot of guys don't understand why at the very beginning, the very when you open up the first page, it has the firefighters and it has their 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 residence address, where they live, and all that in there. John, explain explain the, the background you always talk about with that about the the address. Right. Well, you you can see the top left, and of course, Glenn knows probably a lot more about this than I do. But just visually looking at it, you can see the top left is the foreman and the assistant foreman, which is essentially the captain and lieutenants. 
um, engineer and assistant engineer, just as assistant, assuming he's assistant engineer, and then fireman, the word fireman, and then all the way, rest of the way down that page is fireman. Timothy McAuliffe and Robert Geddes and uh, John Cotton. Now you can see the guys that are crossed out in red. Those guys no longer work there. And I sent you the second page, which is the right hand of that same page that we're looking at. And all of them have a little note over there that says, uh, transfer to engine company 2A, transfer to engine company 4O. So those guys were essentially off the roster and uh, had been transferred to somewhere else. And th this is the end first of the 19th century here, right? So this is where all the uh, names are listed of all the members. One th interesting thing, by the way, we'll note here is that in those days, it was a one platoon system. So you got breakfast, lunch, and dinner off and a few days a month, but that was it. You effectively lived in the firehouse. And that's why if you notice, they put the addresses down of where the guys lived. And if you find the firehouse, you'll find that within six blocks, every one of these. I see there. Robert Halton there, Bobby. <laughs> I see Robert Halton. Um, okay. West 33rd street. I think, you know, <laughs> So <laughs> that would be correct, yeah. That was the address uh, at the time. My family. But uh, you know, John, you want me? You want me to pull one of the other ones up? A real quick thing too, to to Glenn's point earlier about the Maltese Cross. If you take it even back a little bit further, the award was designed during the during our Revolutionary War. That award was designed based off the Knights of St. John's emblem, and that emblem. Some people call them the Knights of Malta. The Knights of Malta were an offshoot that was actually during Napoleon's time, but the Knights of St. John were actual crusaders and the Maltese cross that they wore, which later became more of the Maltese cross, represented the Beatitudes. So the points on the, on the current Maltese cross, and if you think about it, why that award became so important to the men that wore it in, in the Civil War was the Beatitudes, you know, blessed be the weak, blessed be the merciful, but, and, and it was all about virtue. And so that's why that award was given, because the, a lot of times people say, you know, blessed, the, 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 one of the Beatitudes from Greek was about very powerful men, warriors, that rather than killing their subdued people, allowed them to surrender. In other words, that was what was the mercy part of the Beatitudes. So when you read the Beatitudes, you have to remember how it was translated out of Greek and all that, but that goes back to the the what people call the Maltese cross and the Knights of Malta and people go back to the whole napalm thing and there there may you know we don't have the all that was oral history back then so we don't have the written history to try to confirm some of that but that's where that award if you will came from Knights of St. John. Well and it's kind of funny because and Bobby I tell the story you know when we tie all this together and then you know switch into leather helmets and Glenn and I've talked about you know Gratacap and the original helmet so 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 John, you know this story, Bobby. So our good friend Scott Thompson calls me. He goes, Hey, you got a minute? He goes, A buddy of mine's doing a roof. And and in the garage, the old lady, she had two of these red helmets. And I don't, I don't know much, you know, this and that. He goes, I I I, I think it says Gratacap. And I almost fell out of my chair. He goes, So she's he says, Well, my buddy's a firefighter and something along those lines. And you know, would you would you be willing to share, share, uh, sell them? And she goes, Well, you know, think about making me an offer. So I said, Well, Scott, hang on, let me call Glennie. So I sent pictures the pictures to Glenny and Glenny goes, Glenny, Glenny goes, I, I call him Glenny goes, well, Ricky, how, how, how well does he know this lady? I go, I don't know. Well, if he doesn't know her, if, he, if the guy doesn't know her, offer her $400. If he knows her, offer about 10,000. If he, if he, if he doesn't, if he doesn't know her, offer, offer $400. If he knows her, offer about $10,000 for each helmet. I went, oh my God, those were like in the most incredible shape. And I could, I didn't get them. Oh God, they were just, they were like beautiful, Glennie. I mean, because you know. you're an honest man and you told her what they were, <laughs> which is what honest men do going back to the virtue issue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was just, I mean, and, and for our, our, our viewers, you know, that was Glenn's way of saying, look, you got something special in front of you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, and, just don't throw them out. You know? And Glenn, Father John has a vi virtual confession today at three. <laughs> I'll tell him to expect you. I got a Protestant. Remember that. <laughs> but look at that. Look at the. Look at Chief Base. Look at the. Look at the the penmanship, and it's about hydrant maintenance. I mean, it's fantastic, well, right? And John, talk. You, you know, 
growing up in the FDNY, and I know in Chicago, the journals were just, God, they were amazing. John, you've talked about the pen, you pride yourself on your, I mean, just how, you know, that the penmanship is incredible and the different colors and so on and so forth. Well, obviously there's black and there's red and you can see different, different types of entries are obviously made in different colors. All of the alarms responding to receiving telegraph, those are all in red. A lot of the other routine stuff like re relieving firemen on house patrol or re relieving firemen in the bell tower, those are all in black and white. What I find interesting in the old ones compared to the old ones that I used to write in 40 years ago, uh, we, we filled every line and almost every old journal I look at, there's an empty line between each entry. So if there were 20 entries on one page, it would take 40 lines. If it was a one line entry, then the next line was skipped. If it was a one line entry, then the next line was skipped. Obviously what we're looking at is one, two, three, four, five, six or seven lines. And then there would be a skipped line at the bottom. And then that the next entry would enter. Now I also heard, and, and I'm sure Glenn uh, would be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but th there were more than a couple of guys that had really good penmanship. And there were some guys that were like cavemen that couldn't hardly write at all. <laughs> so the guys with the good penmanship are the ones that did all the writing, whether or not they were actually the guy that was on the watch or anything, which is why right. these things are quite readable, quite readable. I, I, even I can read them. That The penmanship is, is excellent. Right, right. And sometimes good penmanship, though, didn't go good with good spelling, though, at the same time. But that's, that's fine. So, so. But you're right. They wouldn't put a guy on this book that that couldn't couldn't uh, put put the information down on paper. So, Glenny, and I, I'm looking at the, the alarm entry of the fire telegraph. When you and I were talking about this, you actually yes. said when they switched to the Metropolitans, talk about the transition. Because what was it? 1840. Correct me. 1845. Uh, Samuel Morse creates Morse code and Channing invents the fire telegraph later. Right. But you said there was a while, how many years after the Metropolitans took over in New York before the FDY did they actually get to fire alarm boxes? Did you say it was like 20? Right. There was there, were, yeah, they were much later than a lot of other cities. I mean, Boston, of course, is the home of the very first um, uh, pull box system, basically. Um, FDNY doesn't get it until the FDNY itself, itself is created, basically. Um, I I don't know why. I don't know why that's the case, because if you see the bell tower mentioned in here, that was the means of communication um, for calling out the fire companies and the volunteer and into the metropolitans. They didn't have any other way, basically, because telephones not a, a, been invented yet. Um, so the way they would communicate was a bell, bell tower throughout the state. There's a more famous one is, uh, of course, on top City Hall, basically, but there were others sprinkled out. And, of course, another thing that we didn't point out here, we're talking about the uh, FDMY, which at this point, um, the metros is only Manhattan. It's not anywhere else yet, right? So so Brooklyn's got its own story for another day, basically, and how they come together. But but the pull boxes don't come until the 70s. So, so what happened up until this point was when, when an alarm was detected wherever it was in the city, and there's several hundred thousand people living in Manhattan at this point. This is not a small place. They literally used the bell towers with a coded system for the different wards, basically. And that's how they knew what if, you know, if you're a ward five, ward six, whatever, you knew your first alarm assignments and where you would go. And then, of course, it was all visual at that point, looking for a glow in the sky or smoke or whatever. So this is a pretty rudimentary system until the box. Now, Glenn, once, yes, yes. Glenn, this, this yes. is 1875. So, so this is FDNY, correct? Yes, it's FDNY. And it's now also, they, they there's mention that. This, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was saying, I think I saw Telegraph on here somewhere, didn't I? Well, they talk yes. about Telegraph is throughout this whole book about receiving Telegraph right. signal, yet they're also talking about the bell tower. Yes. And I, you know, tell you the truth, maybe at some point they're using a combo of both. I don't know. Cause you know, it, you know, you can imagine trying to outfit. I mean, Manhattan is, is heavily populated up through 14th street at this point. Right. So, and there's a lot of stuff above 14th street, but you think about how many miles of wiring and boxes have to be put in. So maybe this is a transition period. I mean, I know that the system started a few years earlier, so maybe they're still using a combo of both because the whole system isn't in place yet. That, that'd that be my guess about it. I mean, they're still talking about force patrol. Go ahead, Bobby. Also remember that not everyone could read a telegraph strip, right? Right. So it wasn't like email. It didn't right. come out in words. It was, right. you know, so they would transcribe anything they got from telegraph. So you may have had 
like headquarter stations or something. There may have been locations, you know, borough, borough centers where they could get a telegraph and then, but that would all be transcribed so that that could be read by the foreman at the beginning of shift to say, hey, you know, the chief sent out a directive, it's from a telegraph or, you know what I mean? And, and right. so that, that might be part of that, uh, you know, evolution of the, of the communication system back, back in then. But, you know, when you talk about the bells, you know, people forget that, you know, smells and bells, right? That was a real form of communication for people in, in, across this country. All the small towns had bells, all the cities had bells, you know, they may have multiple bells. And so they played a big role. People forget the Liberty Bell, that, that had huge significance. A lot of Americans go, they look at it and, you know, they go to Philadelphia, they see it, oh, they have, they have no idea how important that was, you know what I mean? And, <clears throat> and all the things it was used for, bells were, bells were a huge part of, of life prior to other you know, forms of audible communication. It, like the pedestrian bell on your rig, it, that, that's a pedestrian bell to warn the pedestrians that you're coming through the intersection. You know, it's a pedestrian bell. You know, it's, uh. Right, right. It's, it's pretty remarkable how they transition into, you know, we think about how we operate today. I mean, there's a lot of work involved with all this, right? I mean, the telegraph existed then. So the different towers would have had telegraph um, ability. Um, but again, the other thing too about the bell towers, it's not only just even the bell, it's the it's the uh, lookout, basically. It's the guy with the binoculars, telescopes that are looking for fires all around them, basically. So it's a combo. But um, but this is a this is an incredible artifact that that um, that John saved from from the trash heap, like I said. Um, and all I could do is say that um, hopefully some of the people on this on this um, um, uh, event today um, you know, will appreciate perhaps finding these in the basement of the firehouse that they shouldn't end up in the trash heap. They should end up with some entity that is willing to preserve them because there's incredible information in here. I mean, we each have our own collections of them. I've got some Patterson ones. I actually have one. I have one from 1873 from Washington, D.C., when their ladder companies were not numbered. They were letters. Ladder, it was truck A, truck B, truck C. Philly did that same kind of uh, nomenclature as well. But again, they're few and far between. But you know what they tell? They tell the stories of the fire, right? So um, a, a, a big fire, particularly, it tells you exactly what happened at that fire scene in terms of what the company did. I mean, John will go in here and find a fire where it tells them how many lengths the hose they stretched, what the hydrant pressure was, what the boiler issues were with the steamer. I mean, all that stuff is contained in here. And almost, you know, almost yeah. all of these in here, almost all the fire descriptions, it says uh, engine, engine and, uh, oh, I forget what else it was. If it was a two-piece company. Yeah, uh, it was two-piece. Uh, you know, 38th Street and 9th Avenue, uh, connected to the hydrant, uh, uh, the building, you know, fire was in a three-story building and, a, you know, with a tannery on the first floor. And it would go through the whole description. And then at the end, it would say, no work. No yep. work. Yeah. Meaning they didn't work. They went, they <laughs> right. looked up, they can, you know, but they didn't actually do anything. <laughs> yeah, it's a really intriguing thing. You know, I I did a book about a, the Great Patterson fires, New Jersey's biggest one in, in, in the current 1902. And I'll tell you, these journals really helped me out a lot because it told me a little bit more than what was in the newspapers. It told me who was where and what they were doing and stuff. So please, for those of you who find these things, you know, I again, I, I John and I, hard to believe John and I were classmates together at John Jay College in the <laughs> 70s, okay? So I know him longer than any of you do, actually. So, but that was a time period where guys, you know, were transitioning to better technology and, you know, computers aren't quite there yet, but, but people didn't really appreciate how much history are in these things. So if you still got them, please save them. There is someone who's interested in preserving them, even if it's and this, not. And this apart. one is for sale. <laughs> well, okay. And, well, and, and, and Glenny, let me do this real quick. because And John, you'll get high dollar because even the ones for the turn of the century one. What do you want are, for it, Salka? Or a thousand bucks a pop, and then it won't get that much. What are you asking, John? What? Well, what, Bob? What are you asking for it? <laughs> oh, I have no idea. Whatever it's worth. Hey, Glenn, hey, you hey, tell hey, me. hey, 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 <laughs> hey. Sold. I got it. 
<laughs> hey, so so well, Glennie, real quick, um, uh, we we still got plenty of time, but somebody asked a question, Phil, uh, uh, Lincoln Bureau Fire on on book titles, and I know in the past, yeah, yeah. I know yeah, in the past, yeah. these are the books I've always recommended. You gave me, you know, when it, when we talk about how we evolved as a fire service, the, the one I talk about, Glennie and Bobby and John, is Fired America. Right. America by Lions, L Y O N S. His That's an uh, FPA book, right? Yeah, yep. his seventies edition that takes you from 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 uh, 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 what you call it, um, oh god, Jamestown, all the way up into the seventies of how the fire has evolved. And then I then I talk about the the, the romance of firefighting by Holzman, H O L Z M O N. His fifties edition, the last page. He's at like a fifty three LaFrance engine. He talks about the newfangled gauges that ga- gauges on it, <laughs> and then the heritage of flames you talked about. The Heritage of Flames, written by Cannon, who also wrote a chapter for you in Firefighter, the Firefighter One Two book before he passed, on uh, his 1970s edition. And then Glennie mentioned, you know, again, um, as you pass by, too. That's the other one I usually add. as you, as so you the, pass so by. If you're, if you're particularly interested in New York City volunteer firefighting, it's a wonderful, well-illustrated book from the 50s, and it was written by the guy who used to be the charge of New York State uh, Firemen's Home Museum up in Hudson, New York. And I'll put a plug in for them right now. Um, I'm an East coast guy. Heritage of flames is, or uh, uh, hall of flame is great in Phoenix, but I put, I actually put Hudson above uh, Phoenix because it has literally New York city's one of New York city's very first engines they ever bought. Okay. All the way through uh, the 1980s. It's the largest collection of American used and built equipment. And, and it's another art, shameless as another shameless plug from a board yes. of directors member of the <laughs> Fire- well, Firefighters of New York Museum, it's also right. right next to our firefighters' uh, home. So when you do visit the museum, be sure to make a donation for the home, which is directly behind the museum. So um, please stop in and uh, uh, take advantage of it. It's in, in, in Hudson, New York, beautiful town. Uh, you, you, won't, you won't regret a minute of it. And, and Glenn is right. It's all the New York history is right there. A wonderful museum, very well run, great group of people. Um, so uh, stop in. And, and while you're there, seriously, the firefighter's home is right behind there. And, um, you know, it's it's, it's beautiful more, facility. Beautiful in facility. In New Jersey, New York. Right. I'm sorry. And, 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 the, and the folks there love to talk with visiting firefighters. So if you stop in, they'd love to say hi and get to know you. John's room is 317A. <laughs> and you can... Well, Glenn, and actually, Hudson accepts spouses now too. It does. So, yeah, it does. Yeah. And Glennie, so, so so we mentioned we mentioned those books. All right, right. we mentioned Fire in America by by Lines. We mentioned uh, the the Romance of Firefly by Holzman, The Heritage of Flames by Cannon and Costello, and then you mentioned Our Firemen, and you mentioned as we as as we as we pass by, and then that the, the Our Firemen book is actually one you tipped me off to on how to go back and find out where the term runs came from. You know, we always talk about. Everybody talks about, we had five runs yesterday, 10 runs. I'm like, do you know where that term came from? And they go, no. And I always talk about our conversation, Glenny, where the term runs came from and how they came up with that. And, and I, the best indication I had was in that book, Our Firemen, that that that, that you told me about. Oh, and if you're- And, if to and our, bunkers our, too, for that matter. The word bunker comes from the late 50s, early 60s. So- oh. You know, and so John's a lot of us have been involved with volunteer fire departments. And, you know, we always have concerns about young people doing crazy things and stuff. Well, that's exactly what happened. These all these like low, lower, you know, on the lower end of the age scale ended up sleeping in the firehouses. And it became a big problem for the New York City volunteer department because bad things happen when you get young people sleeping in a, in a firehouse okay so, so funny i'm just joking but but the word bunkers that's what came that word bunk bunker also came from you can see it in costello too so hey, I'm sorry, glenn, yes. hey glenn was was yes. there or was there not a book with the with the title as we pass by or as we go by or yeah as you like pass that? by as you pass by that's the that's the dunshi book uh from the 50s it's a wonderful book he was the he was the museum director in hudson for a while and then the home insurance company hired him to to curate their collection, which lasted for really for right into the 80s, basically. And Mike Champo and I went a few times uh, we, after school. We would shoot down because it's a wonderful collection. Anyway, that collection is now part of the New York City Fire Museum. Well, Glennie, so, real quick, yeah. and we have to yes. mention this, and, and I always do in class, obviously, from you, 
for those people out there that are trying to find these books, if they're not in your, some of them are probably on a shelf in your firehouse somewhere, you don't even know it. But if you're looking for them, and you'll probably pay more for shipping than you will for the book, depending on what quality, we always tell them to go to a website that, that you could type an author name book in, and it'll find. And it's abebooks.com. I, you always say Abe, like Abe Lincoln, abebooks.com. No, and just Abe, just Abe, not even books, just abe.com. Okay, A-B-E. okay abe.com. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now owned by Amazon, actually, but <laughs> so we'll leave that off the table. Here, well, but and, but it's a great resource for all these books. Yes. So, Glenny, while we're talking, okay, I was I was you know because I've got stuff all over this office, and I was talking about my perseverance, you know, my, my MPA right. with like I said, everything's still good inside of it. Um, right. You know, that's another question. Sorry to talk so like in a microphone. Um, that's a lot. That's a question that comes off, comes up often about how old do you think this helmet is? And I go, well, let me see underneath. You've always taught me look underneath. And, you know, first of all, let's talk about how you can identify grad cap leather helmet, then how you can identify the first Karens and brothers, you know, helmets, the, you know, the brass with the ventilator style. And then the black one, then, you know, then we went from there to, you know, from New York to, you know, uh, Clifton to actually Charlotte, but talk, let, walk us through that, the helmet, because that's a big question for guys that, you know, from grad cap and then go on and who he was. Right. So before I say that, uh, there's a good book out there and I don't have it in front of me right now. Maybe I'll run out of here quick in a second. I'll get it. There's a, a really nice book that was put out by um, uh, a couple of French Canadians uh, about 10 years ago. They were actually at FDIC one year. Um, and it's sort of a really wonderful, colorful history of fire helmets, basically, and particularly who made them, a complete list of all that stuff. The other book I just mentioned, it's hard to find. Uh, John might be remember a guy by the name of Arnie Merkic. Arnie was at a rescue for um, one of the top collectors that I dealt with over the years. He's since passed away. His son is on a department. Um, he, um, he also wrote his own book called Early Fire Helmets. That's another one, Ernie Merkic, M-E-R-K-I-T-C-H. So those are the two helmet books that I recommend to people. Um, and so helmet wise, you know, you go back to the revolution, um, you know, f- again, the fire departments are the earliest versions of them basically are using whatever they had. I mean, I'm sure there were leather helmets there. It's not until you get into the 19th century, the early 1800s, where uh, we start to actually get regulations for for helmets so if you go to the new york city volunteer fire department city council regulation that dictates that's where the white helmet comes from for the chief that's where the white helmet front comes for the uh the gold leaf front for the chief the white helmet front for the officers that stuff is 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 75 80 years before the fdny was ever created so and again wow. another another thing that we hold on to with the white and the black the red for trucks, all that stuff predates the FDNY. It was actually created in the early days of the New York City Volunteer Department. So, so you've got leather makers out there who make saddles, who make other pieces of leather equipment for a variety of people. And this guy, uh, Henry T. Gratticap, is sort of like the godfather, if you want to call call them of the we'll call it the modern helmet. There was another guy before him, Jacobus Turk, who was another New York City volunteer. We don't know a hell of a lot about him. We don't know how many he made, but Gratticap basically turned his leather business into a helmet making business. And so he was the only one really, particularly in New York, of course, that made helmets for decades, basically, and he evolved over time. So this is where you get the long brim in the back. You get the the, the helmet front with the high eagle. The, the eagles back then were made of leather. There was a piece of, of copper or brass on the inside, right? So it's like that one you got. That's a running fireman design. This is this is this probably dates from the 1880s or so. Uh, that one, but the earliest yeah. ones actually the, the the helmet front piece holder was actually a leather eagle with a little banner under it. It's very crude kind of looking kind of thing. And so we live with that until the 1850 late 1850s when Granite Cap invents the metal helmet front piece holder. And he, he unveils it actually at the, what was then America's first World's Fair, the Crystal wow. Palace, which was located where New York City's public library is today. So it's famous for a few, a lot of things, but one of the most Fire. famous things about it is a place burned to the ground, even though it was made 
of iron and glass. But what survived was his Colombian helmet, Colombian engine company with the metal eagle on top. That helmet was in Clifton. The last time I saw it was in Clifton at Cairns factory in a, an old crusty display case with some other stuff, other really cool stuff. I don't know what MSA did with it. I hope they understand how important that helmet is. The very first one in America. Well, how do you tell now? We talked about it. I know looking at the one Scott had, you flip it over to see if it's a gratta cap and you see a little circle with his, his name's embossed, right? Right. right punched into it. Yeah. And actually the back brim of all the helmets had specific design. That's where Ernie, Arnie Murkich's book is excellent because he literally by hand drew the pattern. So you could distinguish between a gratta cap, which then became Cairns, Anderson and Jones, Wilson, and all the other ones that those are the big ones, the, all the other ones that were created, they all have their distinctive little patterns in the background on the brim. And, and also the crown, the, the brim is, of course, this piece here. The crown is the other is the, what your head goes into. And it's also got its own decorations. So that's how you basically tell who the manufacturer is. And to some extent, the date paper labels is early. It's before the Civil War. When you get to the Civil War, you get the metal helmet front, like I said, from Gratticap. You also start getting more metal and less paper involved, okay? Because they used to put paper labels inside, okay? Those are the early stuff. So you can look at it. You see a metal helmet front holder, you know that it's it's um, it's Civil War era or, or later. You see, and, that, and what you had earlier, the running firemen, they came out, Cairns and Miggy Ode in Philadelphia and Anderson and Jones, which I think that's an Anderson and Jones you have there, I think. I, I'm not sure, but... Anyway, they all came out with these different kind of helmet front holders. So you had the common one was the Eagle. Um, the next common one probably is your running fireman, although it's not that common. And then you go down the list of the really uncommon ones, the serpent. There's actually a serpent, the, the greyhound, the tiger, and the most looked or actually there's a few really looked at. But the most, most uh, desirable one is our friend, the beaver which a lot of those went to Canada, basically. That's where a lot of guys get their beaver helmet front holders. So that that's a period from Civil War pretty much into the early 1900s. And it stays for a while. And then, of course, by the 1930s is when you get the you get rid of the high eagle stuff, the high helmet front, the eight inch helmet front. You go down to five is what we have today. When the that's where the, the Maltese cross sort of comes down, you know, the Maltese cross holder. Or now Cairns, through MSA, brought back the Eagles. So a lot of that we now have the Eagles again, but they're like horizontal. They're not like this. They're not vertical, you know. Glennie, so, when did Gratacap, walk me through Gratacap. He yes, sold his business. To, to the two Cairns brothers, right. Um, it's 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 murky because I don't know there was a it was an immediate transfer. It must have been, but it, they basically come right after the Civil War. I think in 69 is when Gratacap pretty much goes out of, you know, no longer is, has his labels on it. But you got to remember something, too. I mean, if they had stuff in stock already, they're not going to throw it away. So I have a New York City volunteer helmet front that's got a Cairns and Brother back brace on it. And I know that Cairns technically was really not in business yet. But again, I, I you know, some it's, it's a little murky to me. I mean, a lot of people use 68, 69 as, as sort of the day for Cairns, but it, it was probably earlier than that, I think, um, because, again, they, you know, they would use the Gratacap stuff, even though they were the new owners, you know, because they had to so, get rid of it. So right. Cairns, and I know it because I've got one sitting over here, so the, their first versions had the brass Yes. He's underneath where the combs came together, they said Cairns Brothers New York ventilator style. 143 Grand Street, right? They're all the helmet makers are on Grand Street, <laughs> all within a few, a few doors of each other. Anderson Jones. And I would what, imagine we've Glenny, what did the doorbell look? What color was the doorbell on the business there? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I we've always discussed this that because we got helmets that once in a while show up with like one manufacturer's thing on the inside and a different helmet front holder on the top and it doesn't look like it's ever been changed we think like if they ran out of running firemen at cairns they went two doors down to anderson and jones say hey, give me 30 of those okay and they just put them on it because they had to fill orders you know so, so there's some so of those the, kind of things going on too huh? so the the brass one went how long till we switched to the tin one when it when we went from new york how about from when we went from New York to Clifton, New Jersey? About what was it? Because that's the big thing. Guys go, I've got this really old one. And they, you open up, you look inside, and you see Clifton, which is still old, 
but it's not the brass one. No, it's and and the Clifton's are all low. Pro, we call them low profile. So that's the they they're the ones. The, Clifton's making that's the John's low profile helmet. horizontal with the multis crossing it. Boston, by the way, had their own. So it's a little interesting fact. They had their own BFD multis cross. They're the only department I think that ever did that. Okay, for their low, their helmet fronts are a little more unusual too. They're if you look at Boston's helmet fronts, they're actually wider and fatter on the bottom than the normal New York City one. Well, the, so, here's so, the eagle is embossed, right? I, mine is where it's pinned to the leather. You can see Cairns Brothers on each side where it runs yes, up the comb. Yes. You know. Yeah. So by the time they moved to Clifton, which is, I want to say, in the f- early 50s, I have, I have to look the date up, but they moved to Clifton out of Manhattan, and they're there really up until till they moved to, was it North Charlotte, I think? where they are now Charlotte, uh, yeah. when MSA bought them out. Um, so they're there for, for 40, 50 years, basically. And they never had the high Eagle other than they did the promotional stuff. Like I was showing earlier, here's a, here's a high Eagle helmet that was from the 1980s that they did for a short period of time, did presentation ones. And my friend bought one and I bought one. And anyway, it was, uh, it was a whole different era back then, but, but let me, why, let me just go run it, run, run and get this book because the one I can show you really quickly and well, people might like to see it. Because I got, I want Bobby to comment on something while yeah. you're doing it, Glenny. Bobby, yeah. John and I talk about this in class a lot. John and I both talk about how important it is to teach our young firefighters the history of the fire service. So, you know, I do that class called Our History. This should be day one of the fire academy. I do it all over the country for fire academies. John, you and I talk about in class what it is and why it's so important to understand the history. That's how we get talking about this. Bobby mentioned to our viewers, you know, the cool thing about Fire Engineering Magazine has been around since 1877. You guys have every single, I know Glennie's passionate about this, every single magazine ever published. And finally, after forever, you guys were able to get them digitized. I tell people, if you are a subscriber to Fire Engineering Magazine, and a lot of guys don't, they go, what? I go, who's subscribed? They all put their hands up. I go, you know, you could go and you could read articles that were written in the 1800s which is kind of scary because you think they were written some of them yesterday, but Bobby talk about that. How, I mean, the, the fact that was a project that you, you know, I know Glennie was passionate about, about the magazine took on to archive all those uh, uh, decades and decades and decades and decades of, 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 of magazine articles with tons of yeah, information. We, we actually have some journals that date free them further back from the 1860s and 1850s that were uh, uh, Clifford and the men who founded the National Fireman's Journal, which was the first fire engineering, uh, had participated in. So we have some of those as well. Um, the reason we, we wanted to digitize them is that they're the only known existing copies and they're very fragile, right? So um, we want to be able to preserve them as best we can. And uh, we, we have them all in my office uh, in Jersey. So, you know, it, it's really fun. When we were digitizing, one of the things that uh, with the company, and we're going to be doing it again, because when we digitized the first time, we digitized the words, the language, because capturing all of the rest of it was um, problematic for the company that we hired. So now we're looking at actual, uh, almost like photo capture, right? So you'll be able to see the, the ads of the day and not just the words and the language. So right now in the digital uh, editions, you can get all the verbiage as it was written in you know, 1876 or 1877, when, you know, whenever, whatever year you pull up, but some of the, the ads aren't there and stuff. And to me, that's a huge part of it. You know, when you see the, the advertisements for the steamers and you see the advertisements for the helmets that Glenn is talking about, yeah. you know, they, they bought ads for all this stuff. You know, this was the, you know, this was what made the, the, the Kearns better than the Anderson. This is what, you know, who would want that silly, you know, uh, emblem? We've got the flying Eagle, you know, we've got the beaver, you know, so uh, that was going on back then. I always laugh with my friends at uh, Globe, because the Globe fireman suit, they weren't called bunker gear, they were, they were called suits. The Globe fireman suit, I, I pulled up an old ad where you could get one for like 1150, you know? It was like 1150 for the, you know, your jacket, your pants, the whole thing. I think even included a pair of boots, it, you know? And I said, is this offer still good? You know, and I was like, <laughs> you know, so truth in advertising, come on, you guys are running this ad. So, but it's just fascinating, it's American La France ads and, you know, the Persh brothers and, and people who are gone now, you know, the, the, the companies that have been absorbed or, you know, th- there's always that ebb and flow. And now we see this amalgamation, you know, we have the, the big hedge fund companies buying up all the, the smaller companies and, 
and, and, and it's not good or bad or right or wrong. It's just what it is. And, and, and you lose that, right? So you lose some of that nuance and some of that connection well, that we had when, when it was more diverse in the true term of the word diverse, not identity politics diverse, but truly diverse in terms of multiple companies and multiple people and you know multiple ideas and all that good stuff. So Well, that's why it's so cool, Bobby, what we're talking about, we're talking about today, because obviously we could do years worth of shows and not cover everything in the history of the fire service. John, you, you know, you spending your career working for FDNY, we've, how many stories we've talked about, about you can still walk by certain FDNY firehouses and you see the little eye bolts in the doors, right? In the overhead doors, which were for what? Well, what's... well they, they put a, they strung a little chain or a little rope across that. And believe it or not, that kept these thousand something pound horses from wandering out of the firehouse. And it's, and it's true today. There's a couple of stables right in the area where I live. And if I'm driving up, you know, up towards Goshen, I'll pass a couple of them. Big do- the big doors are open. You can look in and see all the stalls. And you still see that little string just across the big open bay door. And that'll, that'll keep the horses from pushing through, which is pretty amazing. You know, and while we're on the topic, you talk about New York City. We're, and really, we've only been talking about New York City today. We could Things are happening all across the country, just as right. important. But in New York City, we always talk about John J. Bresnan. And, and the Bresnan distributor, right? Well, he was a drummer boy in the Civil War. That's part of his history. And he got killed, actually got killed in a fire in New York City on, I believe it was West Street. It was a lamp factory. And, and with him was a, a Gordon Bennett medal winner, actually, who also got killed when the water, the water tower came down through the floor and killed them in that, in that fire. But he was, at, a, at, the, at the time, he wasn't known for the Bresnan distributor. He was famous for the swinging harness. He invented a horse uh, uh, harnessing device that was on a swing. So it would swing in and throw the harness onto the horse rather than having to have, you know, a couple of firefighters lower them down and hook the fire and hook the harnesses on. And so when you go to a lot of the old houses, you'll see the pulleys and you'll see where the old harnesses used to be pulled up. Well, the innovation that replaced those was the Bresnan swinging harness. And in his day, that's what everybody knew him for. Nobody talked about the Bresnan distributor, <laughs> but you know, now we all talk about the Bresnan distributor. And in true story, I wrote a piece about him years ago, probably eight, 10 years ago. And I said, boy, you know, here's the story of John J. Bresnan. Da, da, da. I got an email from a young man who said, I'm a descendant of his. And I'm so grateful that you wrote that, blah, blah, blah. And I'm on the job right now in the FDNY. I said, that's great. A couple of weeks later, I get another email from a young man who says, oh, thank you for writing that. I'm a descendant of his, and I'm currently on the FDNY. So I said, oh, you know, I just got an email from your cousin, whoever. He goes, I, I don't know that guy. I introduced them. They were long lost relatives, long lost relatives wow. you know, over time, you know, fourth, fifth cousins, whatever they were at this, at this point in time, right? This juncture, but long lost cousins, both descendants of John, Jay, of John Bresnan working as New York City firefighters. So if you don't tell me there's something genetically inside of each and every one of us that, <laughs> wants, that compels you to be a firefighter, I, I got, I've got, as, as, well, as, the, uh, as the modern day TV people, I've got concrete proof that that's not true. But, but well, just, uh, unless, of course, unless, of course, Bresnan was distributing more than just water around in his day, you know? Maybe well, it was he, interesting. He, when he died, he actually orphaned. His two kids were orphaned. His wife had already passed. So his wow. children actually became orphans. And that's part of why, you know, the history of the family uh, kind of, you know, uh, dissolved kind of from there. Right, right. Um, so so he, he left his kids orphans, and which was not- But funny you should mention the, the horses. Right. Uh, in my book, when I was looking through the journal, I found a couple of pages. One of them talks about the tender horse being sent to the blacksmith shop. And then one hour and five minutes later, the tender horse returns to the blacksmith shop. Apparently they work pretty quickly. And the next whole entry was from the battalion talking about um, assembling the captains and having them instruct the members in the details of hitching, which I thought was interesting too, how important hitching was. Back and, then. And a farrier, a farrier back then on, on almost every corner in New York City was a farrier. That's a person who reshoot horses. And, and another great story about horses in New York City and all the rest of it, there was a gentleman who said New York City will be out of business by the year uh, like eight, eight, 1880 or 1890. And the reason was that the city will be just, uh, or I'm sorry, by the year uh, uh, 20, uh, 1920, 1930, he said, because the city will be a, wa- a wash in horse poop. We won't be able to keep up with the horse poop from the population because he couldn't foresee cars. 
So it's much like Henry Ford said, if you'd asked the people what they wanted in 1920, they would have said faster horses. So that's why I always say we were there polling the audience to find out what the audience wants. Yeah, no. But I'll tell you another thing, Bob, and, I, and I've, I've talked about this with Rick a couple of times. It was, it's amazing to me that there's pictures and even videos, there's even you know motion pictures of horse-drawn apparatus and carriages and everything else in New York City and 18 and 20 story gigantic engineered buildings with elevator shafts and, and electricity and water. Yet the, the transportation industry was still primarily horses pulling carts. The, the o- okay, Otis Company, the first World's Fair, that's where he introduced the elevator, remember, Glenn? And back yep. then the elevator had a cage floor and people were scared to death of it because when it went up, they, were, they felt like they were exposed. So that's when they put the solid floor and it was after the, after the World's Fair. It all, you know, it, it's a, when you talk about history, man, if you're, if you're getting excited about history, keep wearing your mask outside when you're jogging. That's all I can say. Um, it's just, it's just so know. it's just such a big deal. Like Bobby, and I'm glad you, you know, because we want to mention that. We, yeah, we've been zeroing in a couple different things because we only have so much time on our show. The history of the fire service from coast to coast, you know, all over North America. And actually stuff we brought over from 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 Europe is just it's absolutely incredible. And and John always says in class, you think about it. Like back then, before there were fire alarm boxes, we had bells we had to ring and people had to do fire patrol. That was the most, John always says it, that's the most current technology they were living. Most modern day in history. That's John, right. we had because runners. With the horses and the rubber coats, horses and rubber coats and old early leather helmets. They're in that picture and guys like saying, oh my God, how do they do it? How do they do it? The day they took that picture, that was the most modern day in human history. They thought they had everything there ever was. The Metropolitan Fire Department had, had guys who were runners. They were runners. And, and their job was to do what? To run to the next house and say, you know, to make sure they, they we free, all the language we have came from somewhere. You know what I mean? The it, term it, runs it, came it, from the runners. Glennie, what you got your you got your book? Yeah, I was just looking up uh, on. Oh, this uh, is so great. <laughs> on uh, Abe, just see if there's a copy of it uh, there. Hold on one sec. Um, well, while Glenn's looking up, we have time for another commercial. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. You know, and, and while, while, while he's there, it is there, it is there, it is. All right, so I don't see it in a by I just took a quick search, but it's uh Martin Duscane, I guess, D U C H E S N E fireman's um headgear in America, but it's 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 published in Canada, so there's a, there's a Canadian end thing here too. So, anyway, it came out about 10 years ago. Um, it's probably the best modern source of info on helmets, so it's it's Four can color. Get, can you get a translated copy from Canadian to English to American? Well, well, it's 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 Canadian English here. Yeah, so it's all in a, actually actually it's some of it is in French. Actually, I think behavior. What you know, behavior uh, programming. Well, but I think <laughs> you know. Now, if, if Bobby Halton wanted to be cool in a parade, what he would do is take not just only the high eagle helmet, but have the torch, yeah, the torch. on top. Okay, the torch and uh, like that bad boy. Night parades, like that okay? bad boy. Now, just real quick, here's all the you know it's got pictures of all the helmet front holders and stuff like that. One of the more cool things he's got in here was a presentation by the New York City Volunteer Fire Company, America's Six, which was, of course, uh, some people know that was Boss Tweed's company. Okay, and where's they the fire? Presen- Huh? And where's the firehouse? His firehouse was on Cherry Street in Manhattan. That's where the America Six was located. <laughs> what, um, what was the colored doorbell, Glenn? Uh, what well, was actually a painting of it? It's a painting of it, but I'm just looking here. Um, Bobby, there's, he's amazing. He's amazing. Um, there's a uh, God. I'll have to find it here. But anyway, there apparently America Six made a presentation to the Montreal Fire Department um, of one of their helmets basically and it's and I, I think it was even written in french anyway i can't find it right now but this this is this is a great book and like i said ernie arnie Merkich's book as well if you're interested in helmets and history that's what it is now i as i was walking out before important point we we built the firefighter one into a handbook from the ground up fire engineering didn't have that didn't have a book like that until we put it together and it was very important um that we include 
uh, the first two chapters are pro- essentially the pride and ownership with with Rick. And uh, we included the history chapter with Don Cannon. It's we really felt it was important to at least give new firefighters a taste of why they're in this business. As Rick would say, uh, you don't very often see, you know, a tow truck driver funerals and stuff. But actually, there's been a few. <laughs> we said that 20 years ago. But but other industries, you don't see the again, the the, the connection between the firefighters and the business and all that kind of well, stuff. It's just, it's a whole different thing. Well, so the anyway. with the businesses, Glennie and Bobby, John, talk briefly about, um, you know, we got a few more minutes here and then we have to wrap things up, but John, talk briefly about how a lot of people will know. And again, it's back to New York city and to our, our, our viewers, like I said, we, we could do months and months and months and we probably will do more shows. This would be a great panel one day uh, at FDIC or something to talk history, but um, where people could actually, Man, they would just bombard questions. Uh, John, talk briefly the names for the medals. Glennie talked about a medal winner. You talked about, you know, how does New York City come up with the medals and how is that done for Medal Day? You know, I mean, you would think that 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 the highest award for valor in New York City would be named after a firefighter, but it's not, is it? Well, it is now. It is now. It is now. It's peak it is now. Right, 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 right. They just, they just threw away the James Gordon Bennett medal. They turned it. In, they turned him into a uh, into a villain, uh, retrospectively, which is a little a little ridiculous if you ask me. And it's the Peter J. Gancy now. It's even a problem medal. Blah blah blah. Pete was a great guy, but I think it's I think it was a tragedy. As a matter of fact, there's an entry in my book about the medal, about the Bennett Medal. The chief came and thanked the company in this book for providing the music at the presentation for the Bennett Medal, which was very interesting. Then that may have been the only medal. It certainly was the first one. But uh, a lot of the medals are, are, are organized and, and put together by organizations and groups all, all through the years. There are a lot of association medals, some of the uh, associations, Hispanic Association, Pulaski Association uh, medals are, are in the job. In, in later years, after individual firefighters, uh, so, so the, it, it varies. The, the FDMY would have to accept the medal, obviously. They don't just, you just can't come up with a medal and and, and create it and, and it's going to be given, but, uh, and actually they're limiting it now because now they only give out half the medals each year. They give out the top two or three, and then they only give half the medals each year. Then the following year, they give the other half because, uh, the numbers of events and, uh, and, you know, heroic deeds obviously are, uh, dwindling to some degree. Well, I always, I guess I always found that, that interesting. Just when you talk about the numbers of the trucks, like, how 58 truck got us where the fives came from. And you, I never knew that until you explained how they came up. Well, there was, there was two trucks. Every, every, every station had two trucks. Well, not every station. They're well, I mean, not every station had second sections, but when they, when they got rid of the second sections, instead of just disbanding them, they just renumbered them and made, and made uh, new trucks out of them. Yeah. I, I thought that was amazing. It was so busy back then that they had, two ladder trucks backed into a firehouse and they would go first, they would move up and they would just keep switching all day long, uh, you know, between the two. And you'd have, you know, I mean, cause a lot of guys ask that question about that, but um, so let, let, let's, uh, let's look at closing things out here. Um, and John, we'll, what we're talking about, let's go around the table here. Your, your closing thoughts on the importance of having these discussions around your firehouse when it comes to the history of your company, the history of Valley house, your career department, the fire service as a whole, John, talk about the importance that plays in a fire service career, knowing where we're from. Yeah, well, like Glenn already said, and you talk about it all the time when we're traveling around and teaching and, and lecturing and how important history is. And and a lot of people, I sort of touch on it in some of my in, in some of my lessons. Our lesson, we talk about the Company Officer Academy. We talk so much about how people pay attention to today, today, to the exact problems and issues of the fire department today, of the administration, of the staffing and the manning and the department and, and the city, and they really don't think about tomorrow. But you got to think about yesterday as well. And a lot of, a lot of places, you know, stuff that, stuff that gets really old and becomes historically significant, it wasn't always really old. It doesn't, go into, it doesn't go from contemporary to being historical. It goes through a lot of stages of just being a bunch of old crap laying in the, oh, oh, laying in the equipment room. Oh, yeah, those, those are the hydrants we used 10 years ago. Nobody gives a crap about them. Nobody cares about the, the, the radios that we used 20 years ago because they're just 20-year-old radios. Now, 50 years from now, somebody's going to say, wow, that's a 70 year old radio from New York City. So that's the important thing for people to, you know, every department should have some kind of a historian or somebody to save equipment and ideas and books and records and, you know, a sampling of them, at least, you know. 
Well, we did it where we, we created a history committee. And again, Glennie, I blame you for a lot of my love for the job um, where we had guys volunteer and two, two guys stepped up to do all personnel. I'll talk, explain real quick. They, from the, from the, from the current all the way back through their career. And then they, when they started interviewing the old timers on video saying, what was the best fire in the fire? What, well, how'd you get hired? The, your biggest fire? What was the biggest practical joke? And they, and actually Houston films their guys they actually put it on YouTube. They went to capture those discussions before those guys are gone. So they went back in history. Then two other guys did all apparatus from current all the way back to the first rigs. Two guys were like the, uh, they would take all the photos and digitize them and all the newspaper articles and videos. And then two guys were the junk collectors. Those two, nothing was allowed to be sent uh, to, to the, to the, to or thrown away or to auction without those two guys gone. No, we want two. We want two of those, two of those, two of those, you know, before we get rid of all this stuff, let, let's push it through there. So they go, you know, I always talk about being a paramedic, you know, surf on 1982. We had to use the big Johnny and Roy telemetry radio. Those are like a collector's piece now. And something that's 40 years old in 60 years, I'm not the best of math, is going to be 100 years old. So if we don't start preserving it now, it's going to be gone forever. It's funny you should mention that because you know, you know the story about Harvey Eisner. Yeah, obviously, Harvey, Harvey was with Firehouse, but we all loved him. And, and I, just about a couple of days before he died, he came and visited me. Harvey was working on a project right before he died. He was interviewing all the old guys in the FDNY and all the people he knew with a little, a little script. What was the greatest fire you went to? What was the fire you were most scared at? What was the fire where you thought the worst stuff was? And he, and he had it all saved on, you know, cassette tapes. He had literally hundreds of hours of stuff. And Harvey unexpectedly passed. And everything just stopped and disappeared, and it's gone. They, they, they never did anything with it, which was a, a bunch of stuff captured that probably would have been of value historically to a lot of us, but it's gone. Piece of good news for you there, John. Um, the FDMY did pick up on it, and the film is being completed. Cool Water Productions, Rob Maloney just had uh, Bruce Springsteen do the narration. So they picked it up from where Harvey left off, and it, it'll be released. Oh, very it's cool. Released now. It'll be released very soon. So okay. um, the, the, very torch, cool. the torch was not extinguished. There were people who, uh, and Harvey was one of the most beloved members of our generation of the fire service. He was absolute, one of my closest and dearest friends. A lot of people won't believe it, but we used to swap articles all the time. I'd get something and say, no, Harvey, this is a better fit for you guys. He'd send stuff to me and say, Bobby, this is a better fit for you guys. And, and we did that all the time. I actually have a picture of me and Harvey at, at a uh, event and I'm wearing a firehouse shirt and he's wearing a fire engineering shirt. And he said, you're going to get me fired. And I'm like, <laughs> no, no. I said, if they fire you, don't worry, you're bro. You can come over here with me. So um, a few people that were, you know, he was a true firefighter. Right. And, and which drives our corporate bosses crazy because they, they you know, they like, well, how you, you know, you got, no, it's a, we're, we're the, J John Salk is a great line when people talk about, Firehouse fire engineer says, "Brother, this is a big fire service. <laughs> There's plenty of room for everybody." And it's like I'm stealing that from my good friend John Salk. I love that line. And, and I stole it from Rick Lasky. <laughs> <laughs> no, John. And he saying. stole it from. So we we're all stealing from somebody, right? <laughs> my best lines usually come from people like Plato or my friends that wrote this great book, the Bible. So you know, all the great lines really go back to antiquity because they are great lines, and that's what this conversation was about. You know, I think I think Lincoln said it best. He said in his in his last address, his, his, his second address as president, he said that we need not be enemies, but friends. And there will come a time when uh, the mystic chords of our memories will be will be rung. In other words, we'll, we'll hear that mystic memory of the things that unite us. History is what unites us. Our foundations, our beginnings, the people who you know, invented the swinging gate and the guy that figured out the, you know, the, 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 the pumper. I mean, you know, all of that, that's what brings us together. It's not, it, it, the mission, the mission is only the mission because the mission is the mission. It's always been the mission, but the history is that, that that's the mystic chords of our memories. That's the, un, that's, that's what, that's what keeps us all together. And that's why it's so important and always will be. And, and someday, you know, people will be telling stories about Glenn. They'll be telling stories about, you know, John Salka. They'll be telling stories about you know, Pete Gancy. And we're already telling Pete's story and Patty Brown's stories. And, you know, the men of our own generation. We, we opened up by talking about Frank Brannigan. He was a firefighter. You know, he, World War II, d d you know, protecting the bases of World War II. That's, what, you know, that's how Frank made his hay, right? And, uh, you know, he's, it, it's just, and that's, our history will always bring us together. And that's why it's so important that 
we never erase our history, any part of it. The good, the bad, the ugly, well, it all matters. And Bobby, what was so much fun about putting this one together, when we, we, John and I were just talking about his journals, all everybody that's on our team here, Scott Thompson, we had to check out early because he's got stuff about the firehouse, was like, God, he just texted me. I love this time. He was so excited. And Terry, we're just like, you know, it's not like we're, there's just such, there's just the, the enthusiasm about talking about the fire service it is just incredible. It just, Glennie, well, all right. So if you had a message right here as we close things out, all right, to, to a chief and then to a probie about the history and the importance, what would it be? Yeah, good point. I, um, just as Bobby mentioned, I mean, history is relevant to us today. You know, um, I, from time to time, you know, I've been working on Frank's book. This is now the third edition of uh, since, since he passed. Um, you know, from time to time, I get comments from people like, why do you got that old fire in there from 1941? Like, for example, the Brockton Mass Strand Theater fire. Why the hell do you have that in there? I said, because it could happen tomorrow. That's the reason why. These same buildings are out there, okay? The same scenario could play out in some other city somewhere else. And that's why I have, and Frank had, a lot of these older fires because they tell us lessons. You know, that Brockton Theater fire was incurred in 1941, okay? But you know what? The same kind of fire travel, vertical fire spread up into the roof structure. All those guys died when the roof came down, even though the fire started remotely from where they were located. It started in the effectively in the basement, lower portion of the building, and took them out with the truss roof that was on that building. So that's why I say it's... History is so important. It's 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 what Bobby says. I consider it to be the glue that holds us together is that history. So we it's 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 what you feel inside about why you're doing what you're doing and why it's so important. And again, the brotherhood or sisterhood, you want to what you like to call it, that's part of it. But the other part of it is that history is relevant to us because we have to understand why things happened the way they did years ago, and how effectively the same kind of things could happen to us to this day. OK, so that's why to me, that's that's really the connection to today's firefighters. And again, that's why we start off that fire one and two book with those two chapters, because it sets a tone right off the bat. It's not it's not an NFPA 1001. I'll tell you that they don't care about that. We do because we re under we understand why that's important. And right? I love the, I love the so. first chapter, the mission and traditions of the fire service, by the way. Uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> you do. You know, because that's 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 where we get it these young people's attention. And that's why, listen, I, I hate to say this, but I, it's been a noticeable drop. I know Bobby's got to leave here in a minute, but it's been a noticeable drop in interest in history, particularly young amongst young people. I, I mean, I, I experienced that in my own area here and stuff. They don't see the relevance. And all I try to do is be the pie piper of it. You know, we just try to say, look, there's reasons to learn this stuff and understand it, why it happens and how it relates to you today. It may not, it may, you know, it may not be completely clear to you why, but one day you're going to find out that at a fire at G, they had the same fire and this is what happened, you know, and this is what we learned from it basically. So, well, so thank you. Thank you. Talking history today. It's always uh, fun for me. Um, you know, I could talk everyone's ear off here. If I had to. And uh, there's only so much of a dose you can take in one day. So well, Again, Glennie, I appreciate if, it. Yeah, if yeah. they want to get a hold of you, what's the best email for you? Yeah, so um, they can contact me through the college, gcorbett at jjy.cuny.edu. The, the other one, the easier one, is probably Glenn Corbett, two N's and two T's. Uh, Glenn Corbett at opt online. It's O P T O N L I N E dot net. So it's Glenn Corbett at opt online dot net. And if they go on Fire Engineering's website on our masthead, um, I have another Gmail account for fire engineering, so they can get me that way too. So, um, so I just, I just enjoy talking about it, you know, and uh, I try to, again, connect it to like relevance to, to today. So. Well, I learned something every time I'm around you, John and Bobby, but Bobby, if they want to get hold of you, we always say, turn to the front of the magazine. You know. 1-800-SPANK-ME is probably <laughs> the easiest way to get, get, get just to. Just, just, oh God, now we just oh. went to our, we just went from G to R. All uh, right, John. John, John open email. The, open the magazine. You can't miss me. John, email. Chief John Salka at gmail.com. And I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. And uh, Chief Terry McGrath will be back with us next uh, uh, next show, which will be January 19th. Uh, Solo Chief Scott, Scott Thompson, as well as 
Chief Salka and Chief Halton, and we'll have some more great information for you. We appreciate you joining us. You can always catch some great hangouts here at fireengineering.com all right, on, on, on Wednesdays. And, and, you know, if you just take a moment, you look at the very top of that webpage, you're going to see gems. You're going to see all the different resources you can click to. It's not just one, man. I'm telling you, we can wear you out with great information that's out there. If you want to see what's going on, go right to that mass head and you'll see all the different links you can click on from FDIC, everything. Okay. Uh, in closing, and this is very special, I know to, to not only me, but to, I know to Bobby and, and John, we ask you every show uh, to please keep the men and women in armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. And remember, never forgetting means never forgetting. Be and safe. Very, God bless Merry you. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Have a great holiday and great Christmas, guys. Thank you. Glennie, everybody, thank you. Hang on one second while thank Pete you. takes us off. Everybody else, take care.